Welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here this evening and uh, I would like to uh, thank Amanda and the uh, EUS Network Charity for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, I've, we've, I've known Amanda now for a few years and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the charity has done a great amount of work raising awareness uh, around the US and using public uh, diseases. So uh, it's, I'm really uh, privileged to be part of this. Um, I think the, the, the task that was given to me was to talk about uh, prevalence, uh, in other words, how common eosinophilic esophagitis is, uh, what are the symptoms, uh, and uh, how do we diagnose it. Uh, I'm glad to see that about 60% of uh, uh, the audience today are non-medical, um, uh, because I think that is uh, really vital for, to raise awareness, uh, and hopefully this talk will be informative uh, to everyone, um, being medical or non-medical. Right. Okay, so eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, the first thing that patients ask me is, you know, I can't say the word. Um, so I thought it will be really uh, good to get the basics right. Uh, uh, this is the, something we use in our leaflets uh, here uh, in terms of how to actually say the word. Uh, it is very hard, and, and I also get confused with it sometimes. Um, also, getting the basics right, I think, uh, starting from the esophagus. So. Uh, you know, what, what, does the, what does the actual term mean? Uh, esophagus, uh, as you may know, uh, it refers to the gullet. Uh, I'm trying to see if we can, uh, trying to push the technology to the limit now. Can you see the pointer on the screen, um, everyone, Amanda? Yeah, it's good, we can see. All right, that. good. Um, so esophagus, uh, that's uh, the picture here. You see that is the gullet, um, uh, the mouth, the gullet, esophagus, and then you have the stomach here. Um, what does esophagitis mean? Uh, well, it means inflammation in the gullet. Um, and generally it means where, when inflammatory cells tend to accumulate in an organ, uh, we call that inflammation. What does eosinophilic mean? Uh, eosinophilic means uh, the, uh, the buildup of uh, white cells. Uh, so these are a type of white uh, blood cells. Uh, and they tend to build up in the lining of the esophagus. So this is the lining here of the esophagus. Uh, and when, when the buildup occurs, that leads to the inflammation process. And that often leads to scarring and narrowing of the uh, gullet. And then food gets stuck. So really, uh, I like to keep my slides and talks generally simple. And I think this slide for me is the most important one uh, of, out of all the slides I'm going to talk to you, because it really summarizes uh, in a nutshell uh, what is eosinophilic esophagitis. You know, what, what causes it, uh, the eosinophilic cells or the white cells, the inflammation, the scarring, and the narrowing. And then if we understand this concept, then everything else will follow nicely in terms of uh, you know, what are the symptoms? You know, you probably can guess what the symptoms are just looking at this um, picture here. Uh, you know, how do we diagnose it? Again, you can probably guess how do we diagnose it just by looking at the picture. How do we treat it? Well, we need to do something to open up this esophagus that's narrow here, right? Uh, and then food can go down uh, and hopefully that, that'll be a success. Right, so moving on, what exactly causes it? Uh, well, in a nutshell, it's an allergic reaction to an outside substance, um, kind of similar to asthma. If you, I always tell my patients again, think about it as, uh, as asthma. It's, it's a benign condition. You get exposed to an allergen um, and you get narrowing of the windpipes. You feel short of breath. Here, you get exposure to an allergen. You have narrowing of the food pipe and food gets stuck. Uh, so how does that happen? Well, uh, the lining of the esophagus uh, react to uh, allergens such as food or pollen, uh, most commonly food, and then multiplication of the eosinophils, which are the white cells that we mentioned about, uh, and those eosinophils produce a protein that then causes inflammation. And whenever we have inflammation in the gullet, often that leads to scarring and narrowing in the gullet uh, or the esophagus, as you can see in this picture here, uh, uh, there where, where it's narrow, and I will show you how it should look normally as well. So how common is eosinophilic esophagitis? Let's call it EOE, since we are now all uh, familiar with it. Um, uh, it is increasingly becoming common. At the, at the beginning, we thought it's just because it's being more recognized, but now there's good data to suggest that it is actually 
increasing um, in prevalence, becoming more common, parallel to the increase of uh, uh, in asthma and allergies in general over the last uh, few decades or centuries. Um, incidence, so incidence means the number of new cases every year. Uh, we estimate mean number of seven patients per 100,000 people get diagnosed with it uh, every year. So that's again, uh, new cases. Prevalence means if we take a sample of the population now at this point, you know, how uh, uh, many will have EOE, we think it's between 13 to 49 cases per 100,000 people. Um, Isonophilic esophagitis or EOE, uh, we find it in about 7% of adults who have esophageal symptoms or symptoms in the gullet, which means food getting stuck. When they come and have endoscopy, we find 7% uh, have EOE. Um, and more commonly, it exists in patients who actually present with a food impaction. So when they, you know, they come into hospital, food gets lodged, doesn't go down, uh, you know, they, that becomes an emergency. And when we do camera tests on those patients, uh, we found that about up to 50% of those have EOE. So it's, it's very, very common. Now, who is more likely to get eosinophilic acidosis? As with any condition, there are something called risk factors. You know, if you have um, high cholesterol, you don't exercise, et cetera, you have more likely to have heart disease. What are the risk factors for EOE? Um, I think the most uh, obvious risk factor, the, 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 what, what, what the most, um, not obvious, but, but the, the, the risk factor that has strongest evidence behind it, I would say, or uh, the, one of the, those who has uh, strongest evidence behind it is, is being a white male. So we see it uh, more commonly in uh, white males. Uh, I put some nice uh, icons here. I thought uh, came from PowerPoint, looks uh, nice. Um, in terms of uh, what are the second risk factor, age. So it's more common, we see the peak in, in, in uh, people who are in between 30 and 50 years old. So age is a second risk factor. We see it more commonly in patients who have history of allergies, such as asthma, atopy, um, hay fever. And we see it in people who, do, who have family history of EOE. Um, it is also reportedly more common in people who live in cold, dry climates. Um, and it is also more common reportedly in spring or fall season when the pollen uh, count is high. What are the symptoms? As mentioned before in my picture, previous picture, the narrowing in the gullet leads to uh, most commonly difficulty swallowing or what we call dysphagia. So that's food getting stuck. Uh, impaction uh, is, uh, is another uh, description of it. Uh, chest pain is, is also common that does not respond to antiacids. Uh, and backflow of undigested foods. So you swallow the food, get stuck, and then regurgitate the food back up. And this is more common in adults. In children, young children, and uh, it tends to present slightly differently uh, in terms of more non-specific, really. So they tend to have difficulty feeding, difficulty eating, uh, vomiting abdominal pain or failure to thrive. How do we diagnose EOE? By doing a camera test or a gastroscopy, you want to call it an upper endoscopy. There are different terminologies we use, endoscopy, gastroscopy, or upper endoscopy. And that is where a camera goes uh, through the mouth into the gullet. Uh, we sometimes see certain changes in the gullet. Uh, sometimes it can look normal, uh, and then we take uh, tissue samples. So let's have a look at this uh, video uh, to demonstrate what a normal uh, gullet or esophagus looks like. I think it's important to understand the anatomy, the basics here. And this is the camera now looking at this part of the digestive system. And that's, remember, the esophagus. And now that, that's how it looks normally. And you can see the esophagus opening and closing because there are muscles in the wall of the esophagus that open and close, and that is normal again. This is the valve between the esophagus or the gullet and the stomach. So once we go through this uh, valve with the camera, with an endoscope, we then enter into the stomach. 
And you see the stomach here looks different, it's bigger. And that's the red point here on the diagram which shows you where the tip of the camera is at the moment. Um, you see the stomach is bigger, there's folds in the stomach. Um, and here we are examining the stomach. Of course, in EOE, there, there's, you don't see any problems in the stomach. It's all more, uh, it's all more localized to the gullet. All right, so I hope that was, uh, gives you an idea of what it looks normally. So what do we actually see in patients with EOE at the time of endoscopy? There are four main signs um, which uh, have been uh, reported and studied extensively. Um, the number one sign is what we would call uh, rings in the esophagus. And those can range in severity here. So that's, that's these group of images uh, labeled A here. So they're all showing rings in the esophagus. And again, those, as I said, those can range in severity from being mild and subtle here. You see that top row here, uh, mild, subtle rings to more obvious rings, more distinct rings that do not necessarily occlude the passage of the camera. So when we, we can still pass a camera through that esophagus here, um, but then it can become more severe where we see them uh, obstructing or do not or not permitting the pass, passage of the camera. So here, you know, I wouldn't be able to pass a camera through this esophagus. Uh, and that will be the kind of the severe case, if you like. Um, the, the second set of changes we see in people with eosinophilic esophagitis uh, are what we call white plaques or white little dots you see here in these images. Uh, they can be mild again in the top row, in this row, sorry, uh, and this bottom row you see more severe and more extensive involvement with these white plaques. Um, and that is uh, the second uh, group of uh, features we see. Um, third group of signs uh, or features we see are the vertical lines or furrows, linear furrows we call them. Again, it could range from mild. You can see these vertical lines here in this esophagus, this one here, there, there, and here. Um, they could range from mild to severe where you see clear indentation in the mucosa, and this is this line here. So this patient you see has rings as well as um, the furrows or the linear uh, vertical lines, this one here and the one there. And the fourth group of uh, uh, features we, we see in the esophagus uh, are what we call edema or a loss of the vascular markings. So here is a, a how the esophagus should look normally. You see these red lines, these red subtle lines are uh, the vascular markings, uh, which is how it should look like normally. Uh, in patients with isonophilic esophagitis or EOE, they have, as we said, inflammation, therefore there results in some edema and you see the vascular markings become less obvious. So for example, control this, uh, compare this image here where it all looks pale compared to this one here at the top where you see the vessels clearly. Um, so this is what we would normally see, but bear in mind that about 10% of patients or even more sometimes depending on the, you know, which patient, what type of symptoms they have, um, we, they have a normal looking esophagus. So we see no changes. Uh, uh, patients complain of um, dysphagia or food getting stuck, for example. We do an endoscopy, it looks normal. That is why it is vital that you, we still have to do take tissue samples in those patients and we'll, we'll come to that. So the way we diagnose uh, EOE is not just by looking with a camera, but as I said, it's by taking tissue samples. Um, and that is to look those biopsies or tissue samples under the microscope to check for the eosinophil cells. Um, now, how many biopsies or tissue samples should we take? And that's the question which uh, uh, um, Amanda asked at the beginning. Um, if we look at the data and the evidence and all the guidelines, universally suggest minimum four, ideally six biopsies you want to take uh, from ideally three different areas of the esophagus. So we usually go uh, the lower third of the esophagus, middle third, and the upper third. Um, you take two samples from each of these three areas, and that kind of gives us a nice uh, coverage. Um, and the reason for this num magic number of six is that in adults, 
we see here in this study, for example, that when you get uh, to number six, and um, we're interested in this blue square, uh, uh, because this is uh, with uh, more than 15 um, xenophils, and that's usually enough to diagnose EOE. Um, you see here, we hit a sensitivity of 100%. Um, so you see the number of biopsies here, this uh, and the x-axis, the y-axis is the cumulative sens sensitivities. And you start with, if you take one biopsy, then for example, uh, the sensitivity is 60% which means you're, you may miss about 40% of patients. That's a huge number. If you take two samples, you know, the sensitivity goes up to perhaps 85%, you will still miss 15% or almost one in 10 patients. Um, if you then take three, you have higher sensitivity, four, five, and then when you reach six, you are, you are unlikely to miss any patient. Now, when you take more than six, you see no up increase, obviously, uh, no incremental increase uh, in sensitivity, especially at this uh, blue uh, column here. Um, so I think we, we think that six is, 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 is enough. Uh, and in children, again, the same thing here when we take uh, smaller numbers, uh, here is uh, one, one, two, three, four, five. When you hit six, you get 100% sensitivity. Same thing. So we take tissue samples uh, in people with uh, EOE. Now, of course, whether you see something at the time of endoscopy or you don't see it, some, anything, you still have to take a biopsy because biopsy is the gold standard way to diagnose EOE. Uh, you don't just see change. You see changes, yes, it gives you an idea, but you still have to take the biopsy. We take six samples, send them to the lab, and then we think, okay, what do we see on these biopsies? So this is a histopathology slide. This is what our pathologists or the tissue doctors uh, see under their microscope. And what do they look for? Well, they look for the eosinophils, and you see these um, thin arrows. Uh, so this is this arrow here, this arrow and this. Um, that is pointing to this kind of red cells. Uh, you see this here is a red cell, this one, this one, this one. And these are the eosinophils. Um, and th this is the, th these are the cells we're interested in. Um, and we'll come to what how do we uh, uh, make a diagnosis uh, based on these uh, on the number of these cells? So these are the thin arrows. We can also see something called di dilated intercellular spaces. And that's where the thick arrow here, you see that these are cells here, but there's more spaces between them. For example, compared to these cells, there's little space. Here you see more of the white. Um, then uh, we also see basal zone hyperplasia, and that's uh, where the circle is marked, area marked with a circle here. Uh, we can also see papillary elongation, and that's marked by the bracket, right? But the focus is really the eosinophils, the red dots. So what makes us diagnose, or how, how do we diagnose UE based on the red cells? Well, we do a count, essentially. Now, is it, this is interesting because, because here is a, a slide from uh, same patient, same biopsy. But this is one view, and then this is a different part of the same biopsy. Um, now, what we do is we count the number of uh, the cells or xenophils, and if we get 15 or more, this is the magic number to remember, so six biopsies, and then in a biopsy, we want to see 15 or more xenophils. 15 or more red dots per high power field, which is a standard field that pathologists use uh, in an esophageal biopsy. And here you can see this, uh, this is diagnostic of EOE. On this uh, uh, other part of the same specimen, you can see they're, they're probably less uh, than, than 15 or less in number uh, definitely than this uh, biopsy. So the disease can be um, uh, patchy. Uh, and that is why we want to take uh, more than one biopsy to pick it up. What else do we do in terms of uh, tests? Um, we do something barium swallow. Now in my practice, I, and everywhere I trained, uh, I do barium swallow in all my patients with EOE universally. And the reason is that there's good evidence to suggest that endoscopy sometimes may underestimate how narrow the esophagus is. Um, and it may also miss something called a, a, a narrow or lumen esophagus. So in some patients, what you have 
as you see here, it looks, yes, there are some maybe linear follow, following, but there's no real clear obstruction uh, or rings here, significant rings. And the esophagus may look normal when you look with the camera test. And this is a real example from a patient, uh, a very young uh, guy I saw when I was at the Mayo Clinic. He so went to several hospitals, several clinicians, typical story, you know, they all do endoscopy. Yes, you have UE. Uh, they give him medical therapy, but actually he still food gets stuck. Uh, and of course, the reason is food gets stuck is because his esophagus is all narrowed. So you can see here, there's no focal um, point of uh, structuring or narrowing. Uh, the whole esophagus here uh, can become uh, narrow. And therefore you do an endoscopy and it all looks nice and smooth, but actually um, it, it is narrow. And, and this is again, uh, we had a fantastic radiologist uh, when I was at Mayo who can who's able to um, give us a good idea of the diameter of the esophagus based on a barium swallow. Maybe not the most accurate uh, way to measure the esophageal diameter, but clinically uh, in practice was very helpful. This is the same patient, and you see the diameter is nine millimeter here, eleven millimeter. That is very narrow. Uh, it should be you know you need at least 18, 15 to eighteen millimeter to be able to have. Uh, normal consistencies of food, uh, solids and liquids. Um, so that's from the same patient. Then uh, the, he went uh, and had the dilatation, came back uh, on a different visit, had an endoscopic dilatation, few sessions of dilatation. Uh, you see here a mucosal tear, and that's what you expect after stretching the esophagus with a balloon. Uh, and then after a few sessions, he was able to swallow much, much better. So that is a, a value for barium swallow. That's one reason uh, among other reasons, of course, to do it. Uh, so apart from endoscopy, biopsy, um, barium swallow, uh, what else do we uh, do to diagnose and, and monitor uh, EOE? Uh, th this is the, these are the gold standard tests. However, there are uh, promising tools, maybe less invasive uh, tools uh, that are on the horizon, but need further evaluation. One of them is called the cytosponge, uh, and this is a, a capsule you see here on a string uh, that you swallow. So, sorry, let's go to this picture here. So that's a capsule. This is a string. You swallow the capsule. It goes down to the stomach. The string stays outside here. The capsule dissolves in the stomach and releases this mesh uh, or this here. And then the, uh, uh, the capsule or the mesh, the ball, is pulled up the esophagus. Uh, and it collects cells from the esophagus. And those can be analyzed um, to diagnose uh, EOE. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity is still low. Uh, there's a small number of uh, patients. Um, uh, there is a small failure rate. Uh, but interestingly, in that one study, uh, there were six patients who had EOE on the sponge, but negative on the biopsy. Uh, so that tells us a vital point in terms of, again, uh, the disease can be patchy, therefore the chances of even if we take six biopsies, or I don't know how many biopsies those patients had, um, uh, you can still miss the disease. Therefore, again, in my practice, if the patient has the symptoms, uh, some features of endoscopy, biopsy is not uh, conclusive or negative, I tend to either repeat the endoscopy or tend to pursue the diagnosis uh, further rather than just say it's, um, it's not EOE. Um, what about... Uh, food allergy uh, testing. Um, this is a common question uh, patients uh, uh, ask us uh, all the time is, should I be tested for food allergy? Um, uh, the simple answer is that uh, food uh, standard methods of testing for food allergy, such as atopic arch testing, skin prick testing, or serum uh, blood testing uh, for food allergies, uh, has very poor accuracy in predicting uh, which uh, type of foods uh, actually trigger the symptoms of EOE. Uh, in other words, your allergy tests may show that you're allergic to, say, uh, milk, um, uh, but actually uh, we find that uh, when we do dietary elimination, uh, that uh, having milk does not, uh, uh, is not the cause of the issue, uh, but it's perhaps uh, wheat or, or, um, uh, or eggs that could be causing it. And so there's a huge, well not huge, there's a high number of, uh, certainly in adults, uh, uh, false positive, false negative, therefore accuracy is poor in predicting uh, the food triggers in UAE patients. And we don't tend to do that in, in adults uh, on, a, on a routine basis. Um, uh, 
we are now writing the, the uh, as uh, Jamal uh, will tell you, we, we were part of a group writing the, the UK guidelines on EOE. And we are going to suggest in our guideline that uh, people with EOE may benefit from seeing an allergy physician if they have other allergies, um, such as hay fever, skin allergies, et cetera. And because controlling the, because you really need to control and get on top of these allergies and that may improve EOE symptoms in, in some patients. Uh, but that's just a general point that if you have other allergies, then you need to see an allergy physician and, and uh, get that under control with the proper treatment and testing. Um, another final point to say here, is that uh, we think now, so all these skin uh, or serum food uh, allergy testing methods are based on a protein called immunoglobulin E. Uh, we think that uh, the EOE is not an IgE uh, related disease. Uh, and therefore, again, it makes sense that food allergy testing is not gonna be uh, accurate. Um, we think that EOE is an IgG4 disease possibly. Um, so, and I think that's uh, it from my end. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I'll probably hand over to uh, Jamal, uh, uh, my co-speaker to uh, talk about treatment, I think. I think, I think you could probably do a great job of introducing Jamal if you like, Sammy. I of, course, you of course, of course, that's a pleasure. I mean, uh, uh, yes, uh, so uh, Dr. Jamal Hayat uh, is a, a fantastic colleague of mine, close friend and uh, collaborator, and he, uh, had, he has great experience with EOE um, uh, and uh, he's again part of the group writing the UK guidelines, uh, nationally, internationally recognized expert. Uh, I think he also took part, uh, I'm fairly sure, in, in the recent uh, exciting uh, trials on Dorbeza uh, uh, in EOE, which is now a medicine that is licensed. So he's very well positioned to tell us about uh, treatment uh, as it is a an area uh, close to his heart and he's uh, very well qualified to talk about that. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Jamal, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Sami, for that really kind introduction. That was a brilliant talk as well. Um, thank you. I'll stop I need to stop sharing. Brilliant. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, Got so some nice comments in, in the chat, Sami. Uh, your presentation was greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thanks.